Good afternoon, Pranhan Dar from Wales, from Cymru. Um, I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to give this talk about the context where we live and work and study, the Welsh context, in the in the context, the bigger context of, of the MultiMind project. Um, Constantina has explained to me that the audience here has quite a diverse range of interests in multilingualism. Um, so I decided to talk about three, I've called them case studies, they're research studies, I suppose, that I've been involved in, in Wales. And I'll give you a little bit of a context about Wales to start off with. Um, and I'll very much welcome questions about any of these projects or anything else that Constantine has referred to there in her very kind introduction. So the three um, studies that I'm going to talk about relate, the first one relates very largely to learning and teaching and to educational policy, I suppose, in a bilingual environment. The second one relates to the resourcing of languages in bilingual environments, especially where the two languages in question are not equally powerful and not equally resourced and so on. And then the third one, which I'll refer to very, very briefly um, at the end, if we have time, is a uh, a study, a psycholinguistic study that I did. My, a lot of my work uses word association methodology. So it's a study we did using word association methodology, but we used the context of bilingualism in Wales to be able to control and target certain variables in that. So that's the plan. Um, let's see how we get on here. So first of all, I thought I'd locate ourselves. So um, you can, it's very changing European environment at the moment. That's where Wales is. For those of you who haven't been here, we hope that once we're allowed to travel more freely, you'll come and visit us in Wales. Um, so Wales borders England and borders the Irish Sea. And Swansea, Abertawe is the Welsh word for Swansea. Cymru, the Welsh word for Wales. Swansea, as you see, is down on this south coast near this, this peninsula here. The Gower Peninsula is where I'm lucky enough to live. I can look over my right shoulder and see the sea there and look over towards Ireland. I can't quite see Ireland, but that, that's kind of where I'm located right now. It's a little bit rainy. I'd show you the view when the sun shines, but it's not shining at the moment. So that's where I am. Um, this is a, a view of Swansea on in, in more clement weather. Um, I don't know if any of you have, have visited Swansea, but we have the big deep bay and then um, a, a hill town behind it. And at the top of that hill, you get this view over the town itself. And the university campus is there, sandwiched between the parkland and Swansea Beach. So we've got a very fortunate location to do our studies and so on. And of course, as you'll have figured out by now, our environment is a bilingual one. So certainly within the university and indeed across the whole of Wales, across the whole country, the signs that you see will be bilingual. We have Welcome to Swansea University, Croeso y Brivoscol Abertawa. Brivoscol Abertawa, Swansea University. And you can immediately see from that, that the word order, you know that Swansea is Abertawa. So you can see that the word order in Welsh is different from the word order in English from there. We might return to that when we talk about the word associations later on. So that's where I'm talking to you from. And as I mentioned, bilingualism is everywhere in the linguistic landscape in Swansea. So you see signs like this and this and it's 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 the law that these public signs must be bilingual in this way um there's some more examples for you whether it's place names or instructions or whatever it's telling us we have bilingually and welcome to welcome to wales croesoe gumri is what you see when you arrive at the airport or, or drive over the bridge from england so there we are, that's the context of bilingual Wales. Let me give you a little bit of information about how the two languages of Wales interact. Um, Wales actually has two official languages, Welsh and English. We are very um, fond of, of reminding our students that England, on the other hand, has no official languages because that has never had to be established, I suppose. So Wales has two official languages, Welsh and English, 
And in Wales now, Welsh is a compulsory school subject for children of all age, uh, ages between three and 16. It's a compulsory school subject. I'm gonna talk about the school curriculum in a minute. So that's relevant to that. And I think it's two hours a week of compulsory Welsh children have to have. But in fact, 23% of children in Wales attend Welsh medium schools. So that's a choice that can be made. The distribution of those schools and of Welsh speakers is not, even, as is always the case, I think, in bilingual countries, is not even across the country. So there are more Welsh schools and Welsh speakers in North Wales, well, proportionally more, per hundred of population in North Wales and West Wales than there are in South Wales. But on the other hand, Swansea and to the east of us, Cardiff in South Wales are very, very populous areas. So there are a lot of Welsh speakers there as well, although the percentage isn't quite so high. Um, how many people speak Welsh in Wales? Well, according to the last census in 2011, um, just over half a million of the just over 3 million population of Wales are Welsh speakers and declare themselves as Welsh speakers. Um, in fact, if you include these children who are learning Welsh in an English medium school, it, it's far more than that. But the Welsh government three, four years ago announced a very strong ambition. The ambition was that there will be 1 million Welsh speakers by the year 2050. That's not a prediction, that's an ambition. So they have now set about, and you can see on the right-hand side of the slide there, there are those policy documents, which are about how they plan to make that happen. This, this um, requires deliberate strategizing and policy making to push the number of Welsh speakers up. And there's a great emphasis on use of Welsh rather than knowledge of Welsh or as well as knowledge of Welsh. It's not only that people need to, um, they, they want a million people to be able to speak Welsh, but they want a, a million people to be using their Welsh in, in, in everyday situations. So that's quite a big climb as we know as linguists, right? In what, 40 years to double the number of, of Welsh speakers is very ambitious. And part of what I'm going to talk to you about as the first case study and indeed the second one is driving towards that. So that's kind of a, a context for us now. And the Welsh government has been very good at engaging with linguists, including people like myself who are not fluent Welsh speakers, but know a little bit about how language learning and teaching and, and linguistics works. They are very keen to reach out to researchers um, to, ha to help them with that ambition. Um, in terms of the status of Welsh, we've said that it's an official language. It is also often referred to as a minority or a minoritized language, because obviously there are more people in Wales who speak well English, mono, well, English, but not Welsh than there are Welsh speakers. So it is a minoritized language. Um, and the UNESCO Atlas, I don't know if you're familiar with that, the UNESCO Atlas of the world's languages in danger, endangered languages, includes Welsh. So if you're not familiar with that taxonomy of endangered languages, um, the UNESCO taxonomy talks about um, how endangered as language is from at the bottom here, languages that are extinct, extinct, no speakers left to ones that are critically endangered up to vulnerable. So Welsh is considered vulnerable. In other words, it's endangered, but it's at the most healthy end of endangered it can be, according to UNESCO. And that um, kind of those definitions of how healthy or how safe languages are is judged but mostly by intergenerational language transmission. So it's, it's looking at children speaking the language and comparing that with whether their parents, their grandparents spoke the language and so on. So the definition of vulnerable is that most children speak the language, but it might be restricted to certain domains. And there, the, the, um, the claim that most children speak the language is entirely, I would say, due to the education policy of having to have a couple of hours of Welsh in school. So it's very difficult to for children to come through the whole of their schooling in Wales and not know any Welsh at all. They would know some of the language. 
but it's restricted to certain domains. So that's kind of the status of, of Welsh and the situation in which we do our research, therefore, I suppose. So as I promised, um, I'm going to talk today about three case studies or three research studies that I've been involved in. I'm hoping that you'll find something of interest to you here. I imagine that some of you are concerned more with the sociolinguistic aspects of multilingualism, some with the pedagogic aspects, some of the psycholinguistic aspects. I hope there's a little bit for everybody here. Um, so the, the first of the studies I'm going to look at is in, in fact um, very closely related to that 2050 ambition for there to be a million Welsh speakers. And it's a project, I'm going to tell you about a project that I conducted um, that was funded by the Welsh Government, commissioned by Welsh Government, who set us the task of searching the literature to determine what approaches and methods are most effective in second language teaching. Well, crikey, most of us spend a whole career trying to investigate that kind of thing and only then manage to address a, a, a tiny part of it. So that was quite a challenging top, um, um, task that we were set. And I'll tell you about how we went about that and what we found. The second study is to do with language resources and in particular, pedagogical word lists and in particular, trying to create these resources when the whole language is under-resourced in the sense that there aren't any corpora, there aren't any computational databases of the language. So we look, I'll tell you about how we set about creating those pedagogic word lists when we didn't have the facilities available to us that you do, for example, when you're working with English. And then lastly, as I said, I'll, I'll just talk briefly about a little study I did um, about bilingualism, looking at the mental lexicon, if we have time. So let's look at this one first, then, the language teaching in the new curriculum for Wales. So again, a bit of context to start. Um, Wales has devolved powers, devolved from the UK government, and there was an act of parliament in 1997. We all had to, for those of us who left, lived in Wales, voted on this. Did we want devolved powers from the UK government or not? And we voted that we did. So the Welsh government now has powers over the things that are listed on the left there and ticked. So health and social care, education and training, local government, agriculture, for, forestry, fisheries, transport and sport and the arts. Those are all governed from Cardiff, from the Senate, from the Welsh Parliament in Cardiff. So Welsh government has control of those things in this devolution of powers. Those powers are devolved, but the rest of the list, justice and policing, defense, foreign affairs, immigration, trade policy, those powers are not devolved. Those powers rest with the UK government. So you'll note straight away, of course, that education and training is something that Welsh government um, it, it controls in, in Wales. And that's why, or in that context, um, the curriculum for Wales 2022, so for next year, the curriculum for Wales 2022 has put together. So this was, has been put together. So this was a big um, initiative at around the same time. I don't actually know how linked they are, but it was about the same time as they announced this ambition for the million speakers of Welsh by 2050. Um, this plan for a new curriculum was launched and it was recognized, I think you might be familiar with the PISA ratings of education and so on. And this was in the context of there being um, weaknesses, very stark weaknesses in education in the UK, but particularly in this case in Wales, and a very proactive initiative to address those through a completely new curriculum approach. So this, the curriculum is about schooling from the ages of 13, actually through to 18, but, but the curriculum um, for, for schools in Wales, whether they are Welsh or English medium. And this new curriculum, I'll tell you a little bit about. So it um, talks about not subjects, not disciplines as such, but areas of learning and experience, AOLs, areas of learning and experience. And those are the, that you can see depicted on that slide are the areas of learning and experience that um, all schools must cover and everything that's taught in a school should fall into those six areas 
of learning and experience. And already, I think it was quite revolutionary in Wales, at least. I don't know about your context. Maybe you'll share that with me later. It's quite revolutionary to have experience in there. We're not just talking about learning. We're talking about things that kind of connecting with things that happen outside and around school as well. The area of learning that we're interested in, in particular, of course, is this one down on the bottom left, which is the languages, literacy and communication area of learning. So first of all, we note that those three things are put together. And for each area of learning, the um, Welsh Government had made a statement of what matters in that area of learning. And in languages, literacy and communication, the statements of what matters include that languages connect us, that understanding languages is key to understanding the world around us, that expressing ourselves through language is key to communication, and that literature fires the imagination and inspires creativity. So there's quite a lot there, isn't there, about connectivity, both with languages and the rest of the human experience, and also between languages and between languages and the people who use languages. This shouldn't, be re this shouldn't be revolutionary, I would argue, but it was quite revolutionary. And a, a big move away from languages being about learning the grammar, the vocabulary, and then producing it in some sort of an exam. So this was revolutionary in that sense. And the aims of this area of learning um, were, uh, there's a lot on that slide, but I think it, it's quite telling of the approach here. So were to enable learners to communicate effectively using Welsh, English, and international languages. So it's very eclectic in terms of the language, the target languages here. Aims to encourage learners to transfer the, what they've learned about how language works in one language to the learning and the use of other languages. Again, shouldn't be revolutionary, but was quite. So this multilingual and plurilingual lingual approach is intended to ignite curiosity and enthusiasm and provide students with a firm foundation for lifelong interest in the languages of Wales and the languages of the world. And then there's a bit about ambitious and capable learners who are ready to learn through their lives. So, so really kind of big picture stuff this. Now, you might be thinking if you're a language teacher, you think, yeah, that's okay very grand ambitions. Yes, I understand I want my learners to become global citizens, but I've been teaching them grammar and vocabulary for the last however long. What on earth does this mean about what I need to do now in a classroom? And some um, scholars, including the wonderful Claire Gorara at Cardiff University, have actually started to explore what that means. And some of the quotes from the article that I've got on the slide there, are these, um, so what does this mean for teachers? Well, these aspirations will require a radical rethinking of how the current and next generation of teachers are trained and supported to deliver good multiple language competence. So if you've been a teacher of French, only ever had to teach French, how on earth do you approach this? And Garara and, and colleagues say this will involve a rethinking who is a language teacher and developing a whole systems approach to continuous professional development for languages. So that's the kind of motivation for the study that we were asked to do by the Welsh Government. And if you think about what the key words are there, it's about language, multiple language competence and a holistic approach, continuous professional development, and compare those to what com comes out of the study I'm gonna tell you about in a minute, I think you'll see some connections. So how do we go about informing the curriculum for languages, literacy and communication? Well, one of the things that the Welsh Government did across all of these areas of learning was to commission people to academics like us to write reports for them. So there's one, an overview of approaches to second language acquisition and instructional practices. Some of you probably are, are familiar with um, Pavana Tavakoli and Rodney Jones at Reading University. They put together that particular report. And we were asked, I and, and a team that you can see them named there, we were asked to put together a rapid evidence assessment of effective second language teaching approaches and methods. Rapid, they really meant rapid. We had to do that in about two or three months. And, and it was a huge amount of literature that we had to survey for that. Um, 
all of this is really big picture still, isn't it? And in a way, I admire the Welsh government's admission, I suppose, that right, we need to go back to the basics here. Let's throw out all of the curriculum that we've that we've had so far. And let's look at what the research tells us and grow our curriculum from that was the intention. So I think I and the colleagues felt the responsibility of this quite heavily that we were going to put together this review that was supposed to um, underpin the curriculum. And of course, those of us who've worked on second language teaching approaches and methods for years and years and years and have taught, we know there's no magic wand. We know we're not going to suddenly in the bottom of a pile of books find the answer to how to teach effectively that everybody else has missed out on for all these years. So we know that the, the findings are going to be probably modest. Nevertheless, we, we launched into this project. So I'll tell you a little bit how we went about this. In effect, it's a systematic review. That's what the rapid evidence assessment is. It's a systematic re review. I learned a lot through doing it. It's a system that's used quite often when um, to, to inform government policy. And it's when people want an overview of a lot of research that's of high quality and they need it done in a very short amount of time. But it is to all intents and purposes, a systematic literature review. So how did we go about this? We, um, that, that's when the project was, so from November, four years ago now, until the following March when we had to produce this. And we started out with over 5,000 bits of literature, journal papers, books, um, grey literature, government reports, and so on, um, that we extracted through a particular um, search, set of search criteria that I'll share with you in a minute. So we started out with those. We narrowed them down. I'll, I'll tell you how we narrowed them down in a minute, sorry. Um, so, so this is how we found those 5,000 plus bits of literature. We went to the places you'd expect, so to Scopus and to Language Learning Behaviour Abstract, sorry, Linguistics and Language Behaviour Abstracts, to our various libraries and so on. And we put in various search criteria. And that, that ended up being the search criteria that we used to get a reasonable and manageable but a fully comprehensive set of data. Um, that search resulted, as I say, in nearly 6,000 bits of literature. And we had to search those in a short space of time to figure out which ones were highly relevant. And we had a set of four inclusion criteria for that. So they had to be highly relevant, we found that 309 of them, that was very difficult, throwing out all of those 5,500 bits of, of literature. We found 300 that in our view were highly relevant, so it was targeting not all Welsh, because there wasn't enough literature on Welsh, but on similar kinds of language contexts and also on that particular age group and so on. And then we had to search through those and select the highest quality ones. And we ended up with 105 literature sources that we really scrutinized in quite some detail for, for this particular report. We extracted the highest quality ones by subjecting each of these 309 to a 60 question data extraction form. I still see it in my nightmares, but uh, we, we eventually got down to the sum of 105 pieces of work. Okay, so something that became apparent very early on is that we were searching for second language or foreign language or modern language or heritage language or minority language or regional language. So we were trying to find literature that encompassed all of those things and found, you won't be surprised to hear, that there is much, much, much more research on some target languages notably English, of course there is, there's no surprise there, than others, notably non-dominant languages like Welsh. So hugely more research on some languages than others. And the languages like English that there was a lot of research on tend to be the ones that are already quite well resourced. So there's already an imbalance there between languages that have got a lot of technical resource and those that haven't. Okay, so 
On to what we actually found. Well, we divided, we had all sorts of imaginative ideas about how we would um, section the different areas of the research that we were doing. And in the end, we tried everything. We came back to the good old reading, writing, listening and speaking, grammar and vocabulary, and then general things. And I'm going to talk a little bit about vocabulary here, just because we haven't got time to talk about anything. I think some of you are probably interested in vocabulary, and, and I certainly am. So an example of our findings then through um, th in terms of vocabulary. If anybody is interested, there's the URL there that you can get at, our, at the actual report. Um, so in terms of vocabulary, we found research that looked at CLIL, content and language integrated learning, looked at focus on form and for focus on forms, input instruction, interaction, involvement node, integrating imagery, integrating gesture and movement. Those were, that's, that's kind of the clusters, I suppose, the clustering of the literature that we looked at. And the findings weren't entirely what I had predicted. I have to say, I think I've, I have some experience as Constantina told you as a teacher and you've got kind of get an idea, don't you, from talking to other teachers and looking at the research, what you think works and what you think doesn't. But following this very strict protocols for a rapid evidence assessment, we were quite surprised by some of the things that we found. So for example, there were strong indications in terms of vocabulary that vocabulary uptake is enhanced by input only instruction who'd have thought so this was particularly with very young children and there were some studies that i've cited there that um, seem to indicate that input only instruction but especially when it's supplemented with interaction was beneficial and that that input only instruction could include watching tv in the target language which is something that a lot of researchers, I think, would be quite surprised about. And that particular, the Williams and Thomas paper about watching TV, that was conducted with Welsh as second language. Welsh was the second language in that study. So um, we also found that code switching between L1 and L2 was a powerful indicator for vocabulary uptake that actually enhanced vocabulary uptake. Tasks with high involvement loads, so things like task-based learning and digital game-based learning seemed to be very beneficial to vocabulary uptake as well. And finally, also this um, talks to the, um, the, the um, L1 and L2 um, input. We found that that keyword, you know, the keyword um, system of, of vocabulary learning, where you integrate creative imagery with the sound of the target word. So learners attend to phonetic or orthographic features of the target item and link them to a familiar keyword, usually in the L1, and create a mental image of the link. So the little illustration I've put there for you tells you that the Welsh word for dog is key, pronounced key. And that's an example of how that link word um, um, methodology works. And those were all things that the research showed strongly indicated, or, or were strong indicators of vocabulary uptake, strong enhancers of vocabulary uptake. Okay, so we also found some things that were modest indicators of vocabulary uptake. So things that said vocabulary uptake might be enhanced by them. And those included CLIL context. CLIL is really difficult to research in a comparative way because generally speaking, I'm gonna say something very, very general here, but in a lot of CLIL context, the people who can self-select to study through CLIL and that self-selection might be based on things other than aspirational things perhaps, other than um, simply that, it, that, it, that it's a different methodology. So those kind of lead to confounding variables and, and so on. But there was some evidence to say that CLIL context enhanced vocabulary uptake. And also that focusing attention and intentional learning activity on form and meaning of individual items can enhance vocabulary uptake. But that, that I've said that this must be strategically applied. And that was true of quite a lot of the things that we found. 
the methodology or the approach on its own wasn't enough. It had to be an approach that was applied at the right time to the right extent by the right kinds of teachers and so on. But again, we've got this contrastive L2, L1, L1, L2 um, instruction going on. <clears throat> there were some strong indications that vocabulary uptake is enhanced by strategic, this, this word again, strategic timing and variety of little interventions. So regardless of the approach and the method, if the teacher was skilled at figuring out when was the right time for this intervention, um, that, then that had a hugely beneficial effect. We also found now, and uh, prepare to be disappointed by this, I was, um, we also found that there were some unexpected obstacles to vocabulary uptake in particular in this case. So those included the finding that vocabulary uptake is not significantly enhanced by gesture or movement. And we know that gesture and movement is quite often used with young children or children in school, for example, in language learning, but it didn't have a significant impact on vocabulary uptake. Of course, we might argue that it has a significant impact on attention or on motivation or on well-being in class or something like that, but not specifically, according to those studies, on vocabulary uptake. We also found that um, the sort of programs which actually do happen in schools across the UK, certainly in Wales, where you had a Welsh class or a French class or whatever once or twice a week, that that is much less, less effective than an intensive program of study. So that kind of leads us to think that rather than having two Welsh classes a week, it would be better to have Welsh class for a whole two weeks in the middle of the school year somehow, only speak Welsh for two weeks and then and then not. So the distribution of the hours of, of Welsh classes or any language classes were something that um, were quite surprisingly impactful. And thirdly, another sad one for you, there was little evidence to suggest that use of songs in class promotes language uptake. So Again, we can say, well, maybe it doesn't, but it's good for motivation and it's good for confidence and all those other things, but little to suggest that it promoted language uptake in and of itself. So those were some unexpected obstacles, some unexpected enablers now, enablers of, of, of language uptake were, well, the, the um, flip side to what I just said about the drip feed programs, intensive programs are more efficient. Automatic, automatic speech recognition feedback it was seen to be a big help to pronunciation. And again, we start to think now about how the teaching of different languages is differently resourced. Some languages have a great technical resource, but still lack access to competent L1 or L2 speakers of that language to use in classrooms. So automatic speech recognition is a, is a possible um, replacement or complement to that. Similarly, there were some really nice studies that indicated that interaction with robots in class can be as effective as face-to-face -face interaction with humans who are speakers of that target language. <coughs> and one of the nice findings there, I remember, is that if the robots were dressed up to be quite cuddly and attractive things, um, the, the, the effectiveness was even greater. So those were some unexpected obstacles, unexpected enablers in that study. Um, just on that same note, there were also some powerful enablers that we hadn't really targeted in terms of approaches and methods, but were bigger picture things, more holistic things than that. So we found a lot of evidence that regardless of which method or approach is used in the classroom, Powerful enablers include the teachers, the teachers own language competence and equally their confidence. So competence and confidence was important. Effective teacher tra training and effective ongoing teaching skills development, which is what came out of that Gorara um, uh, paper that I shared with you earlier as well, were seen as being hugely important. It was also considered important 
and enabling to find opportunities for language exposure. So exposure to the target languages in all sorts of different contexts was seen to be important. And the societal and educational context for learning was important too. That's quite quick to say, but in fact, there's a whole world of interactions um, in there, including, for example, parental attitudes to the speaking of Welsh, which vary hugely across Wales. So that was seen as important. And then we've got, as we've already mentioned, the amount and intensity of instruction and the timing and variety of mini interventions. So these are all things, or also, and really, really big, powerful motivator this was, or sorry, powerful enabler, was that motivating learners and making the language relevant to their interests, their community, their identity was really, really key. Um, and that can include all that good stuff about including footballers as, as the language um, ambassadors or, or whatever it happens to be. So all of these things we found in our study to be really, really important, but we, they didn't really fit our definition of an approach or a method. So they're, they're out there as a challenge really to think about how these can be integrated. Some of our headline findings were that the learning environment should facilitate exposure to the target language, including in creative ways, that attention must be paid to the linguistic landscape and the linguistic soundscape in which learners operate. So linguistic landscapes can kind of make a language more relevant in a bilingual community like Wales, and it was felt that more opportunities needed to be taken to exploit that. Technological developments and tools do offer valuable opportunities for language learning and teaching. So I'm thinking about the voice record, so the speech recognition and the robots and things, but they need to be used in an informed way. You can't just throw these things into a classroom and expect the magic to happen. It doesn't work like that. Teacher education should be focused on producing teachers who are responsive. So not teachers who, as was hitherto the case, um, can just work through their learning curriculum week by week and so on and follow what has been pre-decided and set out in advance. But actually the teachers need to be responsive, need to spot a learning opportunity and use it. And then finally, that attitude and motivation are absolutely key. Again, very easy to say, harder to act on. So overall then, what we were finding was that the methods and approaches are only really part of the picture and are possibly not even the most important part of the picture, which wasn't quite what Welsh Government had intended when they set us to do this particular task, but nonetheless, I think is, is informative in its own right. Okay, so again, some of the overriding factors in what we found were affect affective. So this idea of motivation, attitude, identity is about the social context, what support people have got from their parents and their role models and so on. The idea of the rooted L2 self. So what is me as a Welsh speaker? Who is that? Where does that come from? Plurilingualism, which I'll talk about in a, again in a, in a little minute. Um, classroom experiences, relations with teachers, sociocultural aspirations, motivational strategy work, all of these are affective things which were overridingly important in this report. Also, the call for innovation, innovation in the way that we teach. So translanguaging and cross-linguistic relations were found to be hugely important. The idea that multilingualism, whether it's two languages or more languages and whatever the proficiency of those languages is, a, is to be seen as a single system and that that metalinguistic awareness um, can contribute to language acquisition and the idea of biliteracy as well as bilingualism. So I showed you a little preview at the beginning of the talk of the curriculum, the new curriculum for Wales, and I hope that some of these things come through. These are the things that came out of our report before the new curriculum was put together, and there's a huge relevance there, I think. So again, what to return to what Gorara and colleagues said, a radical rethinking of how current and next generation teachers are trained and that language learning is more than an act of linguistic exchange. I like this quote in particular, that is exposure to and use of or knowledge of more than one language. And that's a resource for 
openness, empathy, welcoming otherness in all its forms. So that speaks to the bigger kind of inclusivity and diversity agenda, doesn't it? The aims that I've already talked about um, of, of the new curriculum are set out there. And just to note this reference to plurilingualism, plurilingualism, I don't know if it is in, in the context in which you work, but context in which I work, it's increasingly raising its profile at the moment. And it's about connections between languages, regardless of proficiency, um, which is quite an empowering thing, I think. And certainly relates to some of the findings that we've, we, we came up with um, from our rapid evidence assessment, things like these. Okay, the other thing to note there in our report, we talked about this, you don't have to read all that, that's a very con a content heavy slide, but just to highlight a few words, this call for a supportive environment, creativity, str being strategic, being well-informed, responsive. This, this is a huge, huge ask of teachers now, we recognize. And in fact, just before I came on to do this talk, I had an email through from one of the Welsh government funded teacher, um, it, it, it's called Welsh for Adults actually, so it's Teaching Welsh for Adults. But they have put out a call now, an offer for students, my students, my undergraduates, if, if they qualify, to have a thousand pound bursary if they're Welsh speakers to train to be teachers in a new way of teaching. So it's, it's very much happening, or at least attempts are being made to make it happen. So that concludes that, that first case study. Don't worry, um, Katerina, the others will be dealt with quite more briefly than that. Um, that's just to acknowledge my co-authors of that report and um, the, the expertise that we called on there. So, the next um, case study that I want to talk to you about is also to do with pedagogy. So it's this second one here to look at language resource. And the, this, this is a project that was challenged with the question of how do you compile pedagogic vocabulary lists in a language for which comprehensive corpus-based frequency lists have yet to be created. So this is the idea that when you are teaching learners, new learners, a language, usually there's some indication of which words, which vocabulary they ought to learn before they learn other words. And usually that follows this frequency paradigm. So you use the most frequent words first, but of course to determine what a frequent word is in a particular language, we need a big corpus of that language to be able to derive our frequency lessons from and so on. Well, at the stage, at the time that we embarked on this particular study, Welsh did not have a comprehensive corpus, so we had to find other ways of dealing with this. So the frequency paradigm that I'm talking about is this idea that um, the, the appropriate way to learn a language is that we learn the most frequent words first. And consequently, if you can test a learner on which words they know, you've got a kind of a way into saying what level that learner is. So this um, is kind of operationalized through frequency-based language tests, yes, no tests, and so on. These are examples from English, through graded readers, word lists for learners, and, and all the other stuff that I've written there. So, in when you don't have those frequency lists, how do you go about this? Well, we came up with a three-stage solution to this for Welsh that I'll run through really, really quickly with you now, because the uh, methodology that we used is quite innovative, I believe. So a NFER, which is the National Foundation of Educational Research, maybe, I should have remembered that, National Foundation for Educational Research, I think, um, in 2008, wrote this about the provision of Welsh for adults. So we're talking about teaching adults Welsh now. And they note this response from a Welsh for adults director. So that director said, we've designed our courses on the basis of our professional experience of what we think people say. We have no evidence that we are teaching the constructions and the words which are necessary. That's a big admission, right? This is what we, we, we teach, what we think is right, but we've got no evidence that, that it might be. And indeed, at that time, the only corpora available were things like this. Corpora, corpora made up of children's literature or of other literature, not appropriate for the needs of most learners. 
So together with my colleagues, Paul Mira and Steve Morris, we set about, well, actually they did this piece of work, they set about creating entry level word lists. So this is word lists at the kind of A1, A2 level. They used as their inspiration, the Francais Fondamental methodology, which Guggenheim and colleagues um, wrote about in 1964. And that entails constructing a list of core categories. These are the semantic areas of words that we think people will need, and then compiling a list of essential words in each. They wrote about it. There's, there's reference to a paper there where, where Steve Morris has written this up. So the way that methodology works is, first of all, you use categories like these. So the ones that are not in italics are the ones from Francais Fondamental. And then in consultation with the Welsh Examination Board, they came up with these extra categories as well. So armed with these categories, they then went to 10 of the tutors, Welsh Radots tutors in six different regions. So 60 different tutors of Welsh. They sent the tutors one of those topics per week. So this week might be clothes. And they asked the teachers to write down 20 words which they considered were essential to adult learners of Welsh at A1 level. And from that, um, Morris and Mira um, compiled a frequency list, went to the um, Welsh Joint Education Council with it, who were going to use this list for their exams, and then, then they actually supplemented the list with frequent words from a, from a different small corpus. So that's the interface that these tutors were sent every week to fill in their 20 words, a little bit of Welsh language for you there to see. And the result of that was the Garva Gride, the core vocabulary list, which, en which um, includes 768 words at A1 level, 538 at A2 level. And those are based on the frequency of their appearance in those categories, mediated a little bit by domains so that there's a balance across the different domains. And it was negotiated with the assessors. So the WJEC, colleagues looked at those lists so that's the education um sorry the examination board colleagues looked at those lists said yeah i think that's all right but this word should really be in there and that word shouldn't and we found that quite problematic because as researchers you want to be able to say this research these pedagogic lists were built on these principles only but this these kind of indigenous criteria where the assessors themselves are contributing was something that we, we've learned to integrate as well so that gave us our core vocabulary lists. The Education Council, that sorry, the Examination Council then came back to us and said, well, that's great, but really now we'd like some intermediate word lists. We need some B1 word lists, please. So that's where I got together with um, Mira and Morris and used data. This is another new methodology. We used data from various word association oh. studies. Word association is something that I've worked in quite a lot. And the way that we went about that or the reason, sorry, the reason why we did that was because we know that word associations tend to be collocations with the Q sometimes. And these percentages are from a study that, I, that I'd already published on word associations. So I went back to my data and said, well, yeah, actually 42% of the responses people gave were collocations. And it's quite useful if you think pedagogically, if you've already got a word, if you then learn a word that collocates with it, it's fairly useful. Some of them were, partial synonyms. So that's another way of saying the same thing. And that 19-20% 20, are lexical sets. That's how word associations work. When you do a word association task, you say a word to somebody, they're going to probably respond either with a collocation to that word, a partial synonym maybe, or something that is in the same lexical set or has some conceptual link. And we thought that that kind of makes sense for you to know the words that are linked in that way, learn the words that are linked in that way with words you already know. So we thought this was a promising methodology. The next thing I did was to look at the database of word associations that I already had and actually look at the associates. So this had all, all been conducted in English and looked at the number of types that were produced by word association respondents 
in each of these BNC frequency bands. And you can see there's a nice little decline there. So most of the words tend to be in the most frequent band and then less so, and then it really tails off towards the six and seven thousand frequency bands. So we thought that was quite promising as well. And we thought that this kind of area here was probably where our B1 lists were going to be located. So that those um, statistics are based on some an English data set that I had. And that English data set was produced from 100 queues, 96 respondents. But we set about with our Welsh data set, we thought, well, we need more than that because we need the statistical power to be able to be confident that these are um, de derived in a meaningful way. So for our Welsh data set, we had 900 queues. We asked for three, not one, but three responses per queue. And there were 75 respondents, 75 poor respondents had to give three responses to each of 900 cues. Needless to say, we didn't ask them to do this all on the same day, but they did do it within a year. And that gave us a total in the Welsh data of two, over 200,000 response tokens, from which we could identify, so we could then divide these up first of all into types, and then look at how many types were covered of the first thousand, second thousand, third thousand. We didn't, we didn't know. Um, but we knew that it would be more than, or we thought that it would be more than for the English data. So our 75 expert users of Welsh, those poor tutors again, um, were sent 30 sets of 30 keywords. The keywords were from the list that we derived before, and they gave three responses per keyword. We sorted their responses into a frequency lift, list. We took out everything that was already accounted for in the, in the um, A1 and A2 um, pedagogic word lists. And we were left with, of the 800 most frequent responses that were remaining, constituted our B1 intermediate list. That's how we, that's how we um, created that list. So there's a little bit of detail there about how we actually um, have worked with that and how the WJEC adapted the list that we came up with. And now actually online, you can find them. This Gairva Graith Canolrath, Canolrath is the intermediate level, is now available online. That's, that's the, the list of words that we created. So those were our two kind of innovative ways of trying to create principled pedagogic word lists when we didn't have a corpus. But parallel to this, in 19, sorry, in 2016, um, Steve Morris and my colleague Dawn Knight and I um, were able to secure some funding from the UK Research Councils to create a corpus. So as of earlier this year, we now have a corpus of Welsh language, a comprehensive corpus of Welsh language, which is the Corpus Kened Lithol Cymraeg Cavois. The corpus, you know what that means, Kened Lithol National Cymraeg Welsh Cavois Contemporary. So you can see already from that, like I said before, that in Welsh, the adjective and noun are in the opposite order from where they are in English. So our Korkenk project has produced an 11 million word corpus of written and spoken and e-language. Um, that's the team that produced this. So this is a little diversion now into the, that, that other project. Um, and there are some, some names that you might recognize. You might know Tom Cobb from Montreal. You might know Lawrence Anthony, uh, Mr. Ant Conk, that's Steve Morris, Dawn Knight, my colleagues there. Mike McCarthy, you might know. Colin Williams, you might know. These are all, and, and a lot of the people here are from the exam board there, the WJEC, the Welsh government, the Welsh library, the computational linguists, and so on in, in that team to build that corpus. So that was a big project, which is just completed. And what we're doing now is comparing those pedagogic word lists that we compiled from the topic list and the word associations with corpus derived frequency lists to see what the differences and the similarities are. So there we are, that is my second case study to share with you. And I have to give thanks to the other people who worked on that. Katerina, the third case study has only, I think three or four slides. So I'll race into that now, if that's okay with you, um, Constantina, and we will 
hopefully finish in, in a few minutes time. So the third project is something quite different really because it looks at bilingualism and the mental lexicon and it's a psycholinguistically motivated project I suppose. A lot of my work, my own research has been on word association studies and ways of figuring out, of, of using word associations as a kind of window into the connections that we have in our mental lexicon and then figuring out what causes those connections and why those connections might be different from some people for some people than others. So in this third study, um, we looked at word association, as I say, and we based this on some findings from pre previous studies that I'd done that suggested that as individuals, we differ from each other in the way that we respond to word association tasks. So I've already said that word association responses kind of quite often are collocations, but might also be um, lexical set kind of links or might be synonyms. And from those different kinds of response, and in, in those studies, I had, I think, a taxonomy of about 10 different kinds of response. And from that, you can build a profile from it for an individual's word association response behavior. And what we found, what I found in those studies was that as individuals, we each have a word association response profile that is the same across different word association tasks with different keywords and so on. The profile stays more or less the same, but that our profiles tend to be, well, are very different from each other but they are consistent within ourselves. So I will always have a similar kind of profile when I um, respond to word associations, but it might be very different from Constantina's word association profile, which would also be consistent within her own behavior. So that's what we found from those studies. And the connection with Wales is that I then um, investigated whether the individual word association profiles of individuals are consistent across their L1 and their L2. And a study like this is lends itself to being conducted in, the bi in a bilingual context like we have here in Wales. The reasons for that are to do with the fact that it minimizes confounding variables. So you don't have that, um, that phenomenon where word associations can be um, determined by culture or by when at what stage of our lives we lived in different places but largely speaking people in Wales have a lot of cultural similarities whether they're Welsh speakers or English speakers and quite often the people who are learning Welsh have lived in Wales all their lives so it's not like the Welsh language suddenly is, is associated with a change of country or a change of location or something. So there's that. And also there are some quite interesting similarities and differences between Welsh and English. If we start to um, do a study like this on a language pairing where there are lots and lots of cognates, I don't know, French and English, for example, we might find that there's interference from between the cognates in those different um, languages. Welsh and English do have some cognates, but not so many. And they also have a few structural differences, but not too many structural differences. And those that are, are very well defined. I've already talked about the um, adjective noun order, which is different from that in English, for example. And well, well, Welsh is a verb first, a VSO word order as well, which might impact on this. But other than that, the structural differences are very few. So, what I set out to find, what I set out to look at, you know, is whether the, an, an individual has a consistent word association profile in their L1 and their L2. And we did actually find that individuals Welsh, which was their L2 word association profiles, were more similar to their own English word association profiles than to anyone else's English word association profile. And we also interestingly found that the similarity between the L1 and the L2 profiles increases as L2 proficiency increases. And I thought, therefore we, oh, sorry, therefore we found a yes to that answer. And I think that's quite an interesting insight because it kind of implies, or it might be interpreted as implying that when we acquire a new language, we pattern it the same way as our first language. That's still to be investigated, and I hope to be able to report back on findings to that at some point in the future.